Today, we are going to continue to look at a particular trend. This is a trend that has swept this nation, a trend that has literally infiltrated our society at every level. Everything from legislative to public education to the media, you name it, and it's there. And the trend I'm referring to is the gay rights movement, more commonly known today as the LGBT movement, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender movement. And this is a trend or a topic, as I'm sure you well know, that is especially sensitive in today's society, a trend in which passions can run hot, depending on what side you fall on, whether you support the movement itself or whether you oppose the movement. Regardless, this is one of the most volatile topics in America of today. And for many of you, this is something that's within what I would call an arm's length reach. An arm's length reach. In other words, many of you actually know someone who is gay. Or you may even know someone who knows someone who is gay. Maybe it's very close to you and you're in a circle. Maybe it's you have a mother. Maybe you have a father a brother, a sister, a cousin, maybe it's a son or daughter. Whatever the case may be, the reality is that this trend has probably in some way or another affected almost every single one of us. And given the fact that you may know someone who is gay, someone who is near and dear to you, someone that you love, I am sensitive to the fact that this topic can be somewhat difficult to deal with. But having said that, we have to deal with this. This is something that has to be confronted. Therefore, I'm going to attempt to do so with care and gentility, not like imposters or what I would call those pseudo-Christians who profess to be Christians, yet they're running around spewing vulgar language against those in homosexuality or, or supporting the movement. They're pouring forth hatred and contempt for, for that lifestyle I wouldn't consider these to be true believers. I consider them to be imposters because true believers in Yeshua move in love. That's the reality. They move in love out of a sincere heart with a true desire to pull these people who are practicing the lifestyle out of the fire. In other words, think of it this way. It should be Operation Rescue, not Operation Destroy. But does that mean that... In, our, in, in, in moving forward, in seeking to save them, does that mean that we compromise truth? God forbid. Does it mean that I intentionally conceal reality so as to not offend? God forbid we should do such a thing. Because that isn't love. That's what I would define, that's what the Bible would define as hate. That is what hate is. Let me share with you a proverb, Proverbs 27, verse 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Isn't it true? Didn't Judas betray Yeshua, Jesus, with a kiss? He did. A true friend will be willing to share the truth no matter how difficult it might be. Knowing that if a person continues uh, uh, living a gay lifestyle, that person's only going to reap the eternal vengeance of God. I mean, that is a biblical fact. So as believers, it's in our best interest to share the truth about homosexuality for the purpose that these individuals should come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil. So with that said, I want to begin today by going to Scripture and looking at a passage that conveys such a warning. A warning that you need to be familiar with, that we need to share to the people of this nation. And that is Leviticus 18.22, and it says, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Toeva in the Hebrew. It is a toeva. It is an abomination. To the Lord, it is an abhorrence. So when we see this, it is critical that we see God detests this perversion. He detests this act. We have to remember God is the creator of heaven and earth, and he created us to behave in a particular manner. That's conducive with our relationship with him. And to veer off of that is total and utter perversion. Total perversion. 
It is toiva. It is an abomination. And what can a nation who has embraced homosexuality, such as the United States of America, what can we expect if, in fact, we embrace this abomination, this abhorrence? Well, we're told a couple verses later something we've covered. Leviticus 18.24, do not defile yourselves with any of these things. The things that it's referring to in these things are all the sexual and moral things that are mentioned in Leviticus, Leviticus 18, which include homosexuality. Do not defile yourself with any of these things, for by all these things the nations are defiled, which I am casting out before you. For the land is defiled, therefore I visit the punishment of its iniquity upon it, and the land vomits out its inhabitants. Do you understand that the land of the United States of America is defiled today? And what happens? According to the scripture, a nation that embraces this abomination can only expect the terrifying vengeance of God. And this is something that as we sit back and we look at what has actually happened to this nation, what she is embracing, this is something that should make us tremble. This is something that should make the leaders of this nation tremble. They should be taking note of this because God will make good on this warning. You can take it to the bank. His word cannot be broken. He will make good on this warning. He will fulfill his word. And when a nation refuses to hear God's voice, there is going to be consequences. We're a nation that hasn't just tolerated sin, but now we are promoting it. Just look around you. It's everywhere. It's in our movies. It's in our televisions. It's coming out of our radios. It's coming to us over the internet. It's in all our newspapers. Did you notice the headline of the Star Tribune a couple of weeks ago? A couple of Sundays ago? Front page. Two men kissing. The most predominant paper in the state. Right on the front page was two men kissing. My, how things have changed. You know, it wasn't that long ago that this nation refused to accept this type of behavior. It wasn't in the movies. It wasn't on our televisions. You would have never seen a picture of two men kissing on the front page of any newspaper. Right? Why? Because society rejected that type of behavior. They would not tolerate homosexuality or the gay agenda. Homosexuality has always been something that has been shunned. It was rejected because the people back then, they understood it as being morally irreprehensible. It's morally rehensible. It was not uh, uh, conducive to our culture. Believe it or not, this nation actually, at one time, we actually had a moral compass. We did. But since, we have lost it. We have lost it. What happened? We've lost this moral compass over time. What I want to do today is something I've done with some of the other trends that we've covered in the series. I want to take you back in time and show you how this trend unfolded over a period of years simply by looking at some of the events that have taken place at particular moments regarding the gay movement, the gay agenda. And this will at the very least give you some perspective in the matter. Now, before we begin, let me give the following disclaimer. Today's message is incomplete. I wanted to fit everything in regard to this topic this week, and it is not going to happen. So understand that today's message is incomplete. We are going to have to uh, conclude this part of the series next week. And so keep that in mind. And, you know, this week and next week are going to have very different feels. This week, I'm just going to be throwing a bunch of information at you. And it is intentional. Because all I'm looking to do is give you some perspective on what happened to our country. And next week, we're going to get more personable. Next week, we're going to get into uh, very intense portions of Scripture that relate to this country and relate to the sin itself. So with that said, I want to begin today by going through some, uh, if you will, milestones. And these milestones that I'm going to show you, I took off of the PBS website, and what they did is they discussed particular events that have taken place over the years regarding American gay rights movements. And in 1924, we go, 
And we read, the Society for Human Rights is founded by Henry Gerber in Chicago. The Society is the first gay rights organization, as well as the oldest documented in America. After receiving a charter from the state of Illinois, the Society publishes the first American publication for homosexuals, Friendship and Freedom. Soon after its founding, the society disbands due to political pressure. Now, this is amazing. It's very important that we peer back into history and understand how things happened and what happened in response to those things. Here we see in 1924, homosexuality tried to come out, if you will, out of the closet. It tried to come out. But where was society at this time? Right there. It did not allow it. If you will, it shoved it back into the closet. Notice the last statement here. The society disbands due to political pressure. They refused this type of behavior to happen in their culture. That's where this country was in 1924. Move ahead a few years, just over 25 years, we come to 1950. In Los Angeles, gay rights activist uh, Harry Hay founds America's first national gay rights organization. They just keep coming. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. That's exactly what happens. Keep testing the waters. This is how the adversary works in our own lives. Because if he isn't going to get you to fall for one desire, he'll come at you another way. If he doesn't get you to go after that desire, he'll start working on you in fear. So many different ways. And we see the reality of happening to this own country. It just keeps coming back. Now in 1950, we see this is the first, on a federal level, this is a national level, gay rights organization is formed. It's interesting because just one month later, what do we read? A Senate report titled Employment of Homosexuals and Other Sex Perverts in Government is distributed to members of Congress after the federal government had covertly investigated employees' sexual orientation at the beginning of the Cold War. In other words, we're just dealing a couple years before 1950, around 1947-48. Did you just see that? Distributed to members of Congress and, and covertly investigating sexual orientation at the beginning of the Cold War. And what did that look like? We continue. The report states... Since homosexuality is a mental illness, homosexuals constitute security risks to the nation because those who engage in overt acts of perversion lack the emotional stability of normal persons. Mind-blowing. We had the federal government covertly going in investigating the sexual orientation of their employees, of their service members. And then, take it a step further, they classified homosexuality as mental illness. This is our government. This wasn't people, this wasn't the church, this was the government. It goes on. Over the previous few years, more than 4,380 gay men and women had been discharged from the military, and around uh, 500 fired from their jobs with the government. The purging will become known as the Lavender Scare. What does this tell you? It tells you that society refused to accept this behavior. It tells you that the United States government refused to tolerate this type of behavior. To the extent that they were actually firing people who worked for the government, homosexuals were considered dangerous to society. They posed security risks. And instead of the military embracing gay service members like we do today openly... You go back to the 1950s, and they were kicking them out. I would say we have come a long way, but unfortunately, in the wrong direction. Go ahead a couple years. The American Psychiatric Association lists homosexuality as a sociopathic personality disturbance. In its first publication of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Now, to be fair in regard to this publication and its findings, I think it's important that you know that there were professionals who came out and challenged the scientific data that was supplied to the study. But regardless of whether you want to argue that homosexuality is a mental illness or not, there's one thing I want you to understand, and that is this. 
because of where society was at this time, because of what they were willing to accept and what they were willing to reject, they were able to place a label of this extreme magnitude upon homosexuals. Ponder that for a second. Now, having said that, let me give you my two shekels worth. Attempting to slap scientific labels on specific behaviors or tendencies, while that may appear to be useful, at least in some circumstances, from a biblical standpoint, it simply falls short of the reality of the situation. It falls completely short of truly understanding the problem itself. If it's one thing I've learned in studying history no matter what generation you go to, whatever society is accepting or whatever agenda they're attempting to push upon society at that time period, you will find that it's actually common for them to attempt to back their findings, to back their agenda with science. This is what you'll find. Society in the 1950s simply saw homosexuality as complete perversion, and they didn't want it as part of their culture. So am I surprised that they attempted to try to prove this through science, that homosexuals were mentally ill? I'm not. Now, do I believe that homosexuality is a mental illness? Not unless you describe mental illness as someone who is purposely, willingly sinning against God. If that's how you would define it, then I would say, yes, they're mentally ill, among many others. I don't need clinical studies to tell me that there's something wrong with a person who is involved in homosexuality because the Bible explains it perfectly. It's a spiritual problem. Do you understand? Now, having said that, ironically enough, if we fast forward today, what do we find? Well, we find the same type of psychiatry being practiced, right? I mean, how many times have we heard that being gay, oh, that's a genetic thing. People are not born gay. Whether the actual science is there to confirm it or not, this is what they've espoused. What is relevant, to pe- what is relevant in, in, in uh, this, this movement for them, it's all, it's all about pushing their agenda. And if they have to justify that through science, they will do so. It's the oldest trick in the book. What did Hitler do? Didn't he do the same thing? Having a pseudoscientist? Talking, doing all their reports, if you will, I say that in quotes, reports, showing that the Jews are inferior, they're genetically maligned. He did the exact same thing. So over and over and over in history, we can see this being played. It's a broken record. Let's move ahead to 1953. President Dwight Eisenhower signs Executive Order 10450, banning homosexuals from working for the federal government. Did you get that? This was an executive order of the president banning homosexuals from working for the government or any of its private contractors. So this reached outside of government jobs. This went into the private sector. If the private sector had any connection whatsoever to the federal government, it would also include them. The order lists homosexuals as security risks, along with alcoholics and neurotics. Now, this executive order was merely an extension of that report, that Senate report that was given to Congress, right? That, that we looked at earlier. And now you can see it came through in an executive order. I find it so interesting. You go back to the 1950s, the government's refusing to condone or to support in any way those who practice homosexuality to the extent that they were banned from holding any type of federal job whatsoever. They were listed as security risks. Fast forward to today, and our government is fully supporting the gay movement, and furthermore, they're protecting it. And instead of gays being a security risk, guess what? You are now the security risk. I want you to think about that for a second. Federal government literally protecting, promoting the life of Christianity, a life that is conducive with biblical principles. That's what they stood for, and they protected it. Fast forward today, and it's like you've taken this nation and flipped it totally upside down. And now what they protect and promote is homosexuality. And what are they condemning? Christianity. Biblical principles. If you think I'm kidding, look at this next article. The headline reads, U.S. Army defines Christian ministry as domestic hate group. 
Here's what it says. Several dozen U.S. Army active duty and reserve troops were told last week that the American Family Association, a well-respected Christian ministry, should be classified as a domestic hate group because the group advocates for traditional family values. Did you get that? Why are they being listed as a security risk? As a hate group? Because they hold to biblical principles. They hold to traditional family values. It goes on, and it says, The briefing was held at Camp Shelby in Mississippi. A soldier who attended the briefing contacted me and sent me a photograph of a slideshow presentation that listed AFA as a domestic hate group. I had to show Americans what our soldiers are now being taught, said the soldier who asked not to be identified. I couldn't just let this one pass. The soldier said uh, a chaplain interrupted the briefing and challenged the instructor's assertion that AFA is a hate group. The instructor said AFA could be considered a hate group because they don't like gays. The soldier told me the slide was talking about how AFA refers to gays as sinners and heathens and derogatory terms. The soldier who is an evangelist, uh, evangelical Christian said the chaplain defended the Christian ministry. That gives you a snapshot of where we are today. Where we were and where we are today. We are now the ones that they are coming after. We are the ones that they are going to condemn. And they are protecting, for example, the gay rights movement. Complete opposite. This nation is flipped upside down. Let me show you another one. This, is, this was found in the New American. Christians are extremists like Al-Qaeda. U.S. Army taught troops. The Obama administration's Department of Defense was caught training U.S. troops that Catholics, Orthodox Jews, and Evangelical Christians are to be considered religious extremists. Even equating the major religions representing more than half of Americans with truly violent groups such as Al-Qaeda, the Ku Klux Klan, and Hamas. After the explosive revelations hit the headlines, outrage promptly ensued. Now critics are calling for an immediate public apology to the soldiers exposed to the hateful propaganda as well as to the Christian and Jewish communities targeted in the presentation. The latest scandal to hit the Obama administration and its handling of military surrounds a so-called equal opportunity training course presented to U.S. Army Reserves in Pennsylvania. During the presentation, troops were subjected to a slideshow that included a segment on what was dubbed religious extremism. At the top of the list, the very first item was evangelical Christianity. In the United States, also exclude, uh, included were ultra-Orthodox Jews, Catholicism, fundamentalist Mormons, and Islam, uh, Islamophobia. And if that doesn't put things into perspective for you, I don't know what will. Where we are today as a nation. This is not the nation you think it is. We are a breeding ground for sin, for immorality, for perversion. And our government, and we the people, have been its number one sponsor. We are defenders of sin and perversion. We are protecting sin and perversion. We are promoting sin and perversion. And where do you think we are headed as a nation? What do you think is going to happen to the believers of this nation? As time goes on, as things get darker and darker, what do you think is going to happen to the true church? Well, let me give you an example. And I can show you where things are headed. Let me show you, share with you another article. The headline reads, Will Churches Be Sued Over Gay Marriage? A New Jersey judge ruled against a Christian retreat house that refused to allow a same-sex civil union ceremony to be conducted on its premises. Ruling the Constitution allows, this is the ruling, some intrusion into religious freedom to balance other important societal goals. Do you see that? This is what is happening at a judicial level. Some intrusion into religious freedom to balance other important societal goals. Well, we know what society is moving towards, and you'll see that clearly as we continue throughout today. The, the, the article goes on. 
On Thursday, Administrative Judge Solomon A. Metzger ruled that religious liberty did not exempt the seaside retreat, which is associated with the United Methodist Church, from renting its facilities out for the purposes that violate its moral beliefs. In March 2007, Ocean Grove Camp Meeting Association declined Harriet Bernstein and Louisa uh, Pastor's request to rent its boardwalk pavilion for the ceremony. We have lesbians, they want to get married. The couple sued, claiming that they had been discriminated against on the basis of their sexual orientation. In December 2008, the State Division of Civil Rights found the Christian campground had likely violated state law against discrimination and joined the case. This is interesting. The United Methodist Church teaches the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. To that I say amen. And that ceremonies that celebrate homosexual unions shall not be conducted by our ministers and shall not be conducted in our churches. Listen to the judge's response. But Judge Metzger said church doctrine was irrelevant as to free exercise of religion. The government is not supporting what it used to support Christianity, the biblical principles, it is not supporting anymore. They're coming for the church. You better believe it. We are in serious trouble. The moral integrity of this country is being destroyed. The beautiful morals and principles found in the Bible, they're literally being assaulted day after day, and it's becoming more and more intense. They're coming for the churches. They're on their way to restrict communities across this nation to cease from adhering to moral principles found in Scripture. Again, what do you suppose is going to happen, seriously, to a nation that chooses to make the God of Israel its enemy? What do you think is going to happen? You know, I don't believe the people of this nation really understand the gravity of what is upon us. I don't believe the majority of churchgoers understand how dire the situation is. Let's move ahead a few years in our milestones in American gay movement. American psychologist Evelyn Hooker shares her paper, The Adjustment of the Male Overt Homosexual, at the American Psychological Association Convention in Chicago. After administering, administering psychological tests, such as uh, the Rorschach, you know, the inkblot deal, to groups of homosexual and heterosexual males, Hooker, Hooker's research concludes homosexuality is not a clinical entity and that heterosexuals and homosexuals do not differ significantly. Surprising? No. What did I tell you about the psychiatric industry? Whatever agenda is going to be pushed, they can play a very, very important role in coming out and supporting. What do you see with the needle? If the needle is over here, at the government suppressing homosexuality, now we are coming into the 50s, what do we find? It's now over here. And they're now starting at this time in this nation to, oh, no, no, no. There's no difference. It's fine. There's nothing, there's nothing to see here. And we come to 1958 and the landmark case, One Inc. versus Olison. The United States Supreme Court's rules in favor of the First Amendment rights of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender magazine. It's called One, the Homosexual Magazine. The suit was filed after the U.S. Postal Service and FBI declared the magazine obscene material. And it marks the first time the United States Supreme Court rules in favor of homosexuals. This ruling of this particular court case is, is monumental in regard to the gay rights movement. Because it's really at this point, when you see at a judicial level, at the highest level, the US, United States Supreme Court, where we see things start to take root. Be given a, a place that where its roots can grow and it can sprout up. The other thing that is worth pointing out here, though, and this is so interesting, to show you where society was still at, you had the FBI and the United States Postal Service looking at homosexuality as perversion. Governmental entities, right? These are governmental operations. And they're seeing these, this at this time in the 50s, as perversion. It's like, what do you see going on when you start looking at history? You're seeing a war. There's a battle between good and evil. And it's like at its precipice. 
You can see the fighting of it. But man, when you, you see the power of the United States Supreme Court and how influential their decisions are in this nation, do not underestimate them. It's incredible. Oh, I'm sorry. 1962, we're going to move forward. Illinois repeals its sodomy laws, becoming the first U.S. state to decriminalize homosexuality. So here you can see there is, there is a significant movement happening here to the point now you have states independently. They had what? They had sodomy laws on the books. Well, what does that tell you? Homosexuality was a punishable offense. In this country, it at one time, was considered criminal. It was a criminal act. But now we start to see this momentum, momentum grow here and removing these laws, repealing these laws, lifting, if you will, the righteous fences that have been established in this country that allowed us to receive blessing from God. Go ahead to 1973. The Board of the American Psychiatric Association votes to remove homosexuality from its list of mental illness. Big surprise. Here we go, just proving my point again. Now they finally come out. Okay, society's moving in one direction. The agenda has to be met. So now we'll come in and, oh, now it's no longer a mental illness. In his book, None Dare Call It Treason, John Stormer comments on this very thing of how this industry, the psychiatric industry, has been corrupted. And it plays a role in what we're talking about, a very significant role. Look at what he says. Just as in the, the fields of education, religion, press, radio, and TV, the collectivists have succeeded in infiltrating and twisting the honorable psychiatric and psychological professions to their own ends. The new leaders in the psychiatric field propose to re-educate the world's population using psychological procedures to create a new breed of amoral men, not moral, amoral men, who will accept a one-world socialistic government. There's a lot of things at play here with all these sins that are reaching heaven. Now, this author, John Stormer, he goes on to tell a story of a particular doctor. His name is Dr. G. Brock Chisholm. And Dr. Chisholm, he was, he was actually the first head of the World Federation of Mental Health and actually later became the head of the World Health Organization for the United Nations. So when you want to talk about influential, this is the guy. Now, Stormer quotes Chisholm in an address that he gave to a large group of psychiatrists and high government officials in Washington, D.C. in 1945, and I want to share with you this quote and what he said. This will give you some perspective. What basic psychological distortion can be found in every civilization of which we know anything? The only psychological force capable of producing these perversions is morality. You just catch what he said? The concept of right and wrong, the reinterpretation and eventual eradication of the concept of right and wrong are the belated objectives of nearly all psychotherapy. That is an amazing statement. Again, he's quoted the same doctor as saying the following. The pretense is made that to do away with right and wrong would produce uncivilized people, immorality, lawlessness, and social chaos. The fact is that most psychiatrists and psychologists and other respected people have escaped from moral chains and are able to think freely. In other words, morality is bondage. This is what the industry is peddling. This is not to say there is not still reputable psychologists and psychiatrists, uh, 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 psychiatrists among us today, but this is where the industry was. When you get to the 50s, this is where it was moving towards, right here. Now, in response to this statement that is up here, listen to what Stormer states. For the rare citizen who escapes indoctrination in the new social order and progressive schools, for the Bible-believing Christian who rejects theologians who teach that sturdy souls who hold to age-old concepts of right and wrong and are vocal about it, the collectivists have one final ultimate weapon. Declare them insane. Do you get it? Do you get what's going to happen 
Do you get what has already happened? Terms like homophobics, they're placing labels. You're insane. You have fear. Hate speech, all these things are coming, and they're here. It's unbelievable. He wrote this in the 60s because he saw what was coming to this nation. He was trying to warn us. Now, continuing on as we move through this trend, in 1974, we read, Kathy uh, Kazachenko becomes the first openly gay American elected to public office when she wins a seat on the Ann Arbor, Michigan City Council. Epic. This is epic. 1974. Remember, the government was firing homosexuals from their jobs. They were not allowed to hold federal jobs or even private corporations affiliated to the government. And now they're holding public office. See the momentum? See the movement? See what's happening? We come to 1977. We see it, it continues. Harvey Milk wins a seat on the San Francisco Board of Supervisor and is responsible for uh, introducing a gay rights ordinance protecting gays and lesbians from being fired from their jobs. Milk also leads a successful campaign against Proposition 6, an initiative forbidding homosexual teachers. It's interesting. Every time we start digging into the history of the legislation that existed, it prevented homosexuals from doing anything in the government, from being teachers. It was not allowed. We had suppressed wickedness. We were suppressing wickedness. 1979, an estimated 75,000 people participate in the National March on Washington for lesbian and gay rights. LGBT people and straight allies demand equal civil rights and urge for the passage of protective civil rights legislature. It's amazing that they start throwing around terms like civil rights, and they want to affiliate civil rights to their cause. In fact, Martin Luther King's wife had, at one time, tried to round up many African Americans to promote the gay agenda and liken it to civil rights, and she was rebuked on a very large level by many of her contemporaries for doing that. But this is what happens. When we have a wicked thing, we've got to grab a good thing and mix it together so that we can anything to promote the cause. Satan is very, very clever. Moving ahead to 1981. The New York Times points the first story, prints the first story, rather, of a rare pneumonia and skin cancer found and 41 gay men in New York and California. The CDC initially refers to the disease as GRID, Gay-Related Immune Deficiency Disorder. When the symptoms are found outside the gay community, Bruce Voller, biologist and founder, keep this in mind, founder of the National Gay Task Force, successfully lobbies to change the name of the disease to AIDS. I want you to understand what just happened right here? This is part of the problem. Here they had the CDC. They're looking at this disease. The first name that it was, that it was described to it was GRID, gay-related immune deficiency. You look at this, and when you have that disease, what do you think would have happened? As that went out, as that was trumpeted out through the media, that it was called gay-related immune deficiency disorder. How many people do you think would, would really want to uh, experiment, shall we say, as a lot of kids are doing in college, with homosexuality? Not very many. They were terrified because these men were dying. AIDS took many lives at this time. And the fact that this guy went out to change the name, it is not a coincidence. You have to see this is straight from the pit of hell to change the name, because nothing, we do not, Satan does not want you to fear when you sin. Isn't that what he did in the garden with Eve? He stripped the fear. You will not surely die. The exact same thing is going on here. we got to change the name. We don't want to panic people and think that this is a gay thing, not to mention the people that were outside 
that we're actually getting this, let's not forget, they had multiple sexual partners and they were sharing needles. Okay? The bottom line is where they, were, they had isolated this, where they had found all this starting to happen was in the gay community. This is mind-blowing. This is what we're, we're in a psychological manipulation. Every day of your life, every time you turn the TV on, Satan is trying to manipulate you. 1987. AIDS advocacy group, ACT UP, is formed in response to the devastating effects the disease has had on the gay and lesbian community. In New York, the group holds demonstrations against pharmaceutical companies profiteering from the AIDS-related drugs as well as the lack of AIDS policies protecting patients from outrageous prescription prices. This is, this is amazing to me. When you look at this, you, you, you'll find the pharmaceutical company doesn't care who they pillage. Um, but, <laughs> you know, we go back to last week's deal, but... Here you see, at the very beginning, is that the devastating effects of the disease had on the gay and lesbian community. So people don't want to talk about it, that it's gay-related. We can't talk about that. We just got to say it's, it's a generic, we got to use a generic term. Going to 2000, Vermont becomes the first state in the U.S. to legalize civil unions and registered partnerships between same-sex couples. Well, here we go. I mean, this is 2000, this is not that long ago, and here we have Vermont, the first state to legalize civil unions. What does that do? It creates momentum. So we come to 2003 in Lawrence v. Texas. The U.S. Supreme Court rules that sodomy laws in the U.S. are unconstitutional. Remember? It was criminal at one time. But now, it is not criminal. It's protected. The exact opposite. Federal level. 2004, Massachusetts becomes the first state to legalize gay marriage. The court finds the prohibition of gay marriage unconstitutional because it denies dignity and equality of all individuals. In the following six years, New Hampshire, Vermont, Connecticut, Iowa, and Washington, D.C. will follow suit. Jump ahead, 2008, California voters approve Proposition 8. How many of you remember Proposition 8? A lot of you. Making same-sex marriage in California illegal. I remember this in 2008. The people in California went bananas. And this spread all, all over the entire nation. The passing of uh, the ballot garners national attention from gay rights supporters across the U.S. Prop 8 inspires the No H8 campaign, a photo project that uses celebrities to promote marriage equality. Another psychological manipulation over and over again to push an agenda. 2010, a federal judge in San Francisco decides that gays and lesbians have the constitutional right to marry and that Prop 8 is unconstitutional. Lawyers will challenge the finding, but if you know what happened last year, California now has that ability. They, have, they, they allow gay marriage as of 2013. There's an intense pressure being pushed, going one way, and that's to sin. December 18, 2010, the U.S. Senate votes 65 to 31 to repeal don't ask, don't tell policy, allowing gays and lesbians to serve openly in the U.S. military. So 1950, we're kicking them out. Come to 2010, we're opening our arms. We're embracing them, protecting them, promoting them. And I'm just showing you where we were at on a governmental level to where we're at today. 2011, President Obama states his administration will no longer defend the Defense of Marriage Act, which bans the recognition of same-sex marriage. Think about that statement for a second. Just think about that. No longer, at the highest level, the administration, will they defend marriage. Something this country, before its founding, going back to the 1600s, defended. What does this tell you as we go through, as I just threw all this information at you? You see how everything just turned, flipped up on its back? This nation is at its boiling point. We're in serious trouble. Now, if that weren't enough, as if that weren't the extent of the problem, we find it even gets worse when you look at the church today. 
Homosexuality has become so prevalent, so normalized, that it's even breached the walls of the churches across this country. Churches who, rather than condemning the lifestyle, condemning the sin, willing to show forgiveness, willing to show love, we find many churches now, they're just supporting the lifestyle. We'll just support where you're at, where you are. And you can typically identify these churches quite easily without even having to go in their doors or even look at their websites because they usually have the rainbow flags hanging outside. The symbol to tell you that if you practice homosexuality, toeva, if you practice what is abominable to Yeshua, to Jesus, you're welcomed here. That blows my mind. And unfortunately, this trend is becoming more and more common in the church. Today we have more uh, gay and lesbian pastors, teachers, rabbis than we've ever had. And we're only adding to the number. They're leading congregations. They're leading their congregants in worship. They're leading their congregations. They're teaching them from the Bible while embracing depravity and perversion. And not embracing it, but promoting it. In fact, I even heard one pastor, this was a couple years ago, he went on to express to people that his relationship, he is a pastor, his relationship that he has with his significant other, who was also a man, was a gift of the Holy Spirit. And how dare anyone interrupt that relationship that is a gift of the Holy Spirit. You can't say anything against that. It's, it's like you throw your arms up and say, what can I do? It's God's gift to me. Let me share with you this passage out of Scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. This is scriptural truth, and we are living it today in this nation. This scripture is resonating. Peter says this, These are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness and darkness forever. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. Did you catch that? That is amazing because that is exactly what is happening here. That is exactly what is happening. They allure through the lust of the flesh. Man, the thing that we want to hear that our flesh wants to hear as we're entering a congregation is don't stop those things that your flesh likes doing. Your flesh wants to hear that, right? That's the best thing you can tell your flesh. You walk in a door and once they say, oh, you're, you're, you're involved in homosexuality, don't worry, don't turn from that. We embrace that here. And the flesh is pacified. The flesh grabs onto it. And yet the spirit is killed. The spirit is severed. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is severed. God forbid, because that conviction of the Holy Spirit is life. That is life. To turn from death. We need that. Moving on in verse 19. While they promise them liberty, freedom. You know, one of the catchphrases that you need to be careful of is they'll use this, Reconciliation to Christ. Anytime you see that phrase, you better know where you're going. This reconciliation to Christ. Reconciliation for Christ. It's all about this reconciliation. They're, what they're reconciling is abomination in the church. That's what they're attempting to rec- uh, reconcile. They promise them liberty. They themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. That is scriptural truth. That is what is happening right now in the churches today. The music team can come back up. Next week is going to have a very different feel. We're going to look at uh, homosexuality in a very personal level. And I'm going to show you a video next week. And I think it is really telling. A particular video is, a, is, a, is of a Christian man telling his story. So we're going to look at that, and then I'm going to get into why we're even talking about this and how it's relevant to this nation and the death of America. So Shabbat Shalom, 